Right, thank you everyone. So I'm from Hong Kong and I also have my uh, supervisor here, Professor Han Song. And what I'm going to talk about today is actually based on my thesis because I'm one of the PhD students there. And it is about French and Chinese preference and willingness to pay applying the uh, hedonic pricing model. And when I was looking into it, obviously I have data from France and China and there's element about knowledge that I built into the model. It is not significant for French. However, it is very significant for Chinese. And that's the reason why I abstract that part and I look into the millennial willingness to pay in terms of how the wine preference and is it related to their knowledge level. So before I start, so just now, Gregory already talked a little bit about the, uh, uh, the export situation. This one, uh, I received it from Chateau Pap Clermont because they are one of my wine sponsors. So you can see the wines that come into the world on June 2017. You can see over 60% were actually sent uh, to Hong Kong and China. So this figures is talking about the value over 15 euro. So um, as you might be aware, a lot of the wine coming into Hong Kong might be transit into China. So 60% were sent to Hong Kong and China. There are also, of course, America and also the UK are the main other countries. And last year in my presentation with the AWE, I talk about this explorative study based on my 14 uh, interviews with Chinese and French. So I, this one is about the, what's the meaning of wine to them. So I explore and come to three areas, which is about the physical preference, about health and beauty, about the uh, cultural and historical preference, and also about the hedonic part. So if you are interested about that one, you can go back to last year and my abstract should still be there. Right, about knowledge and wine consumption. So later the part, there's already a lot of the study looking into knowledge and the relationship related to consumption pattern, consumption habits, and the purchasing habits, and people's wine education. So again, in my study, this one, uh, I'm also going to look into it, whether there's going into the same direction about knowledge and also their wine preference as well. So, Instead of going through all the details, coming to the research gap. So obviously everyone is interested about the Chinese preference currently be because of what's going on currently. <laughs> right, so, and there are quite a lot of studies that are based on secondary data. I'm sure you've seen a lot these two days. So what I did is a uh, primary research. I go, um, the first part of my uh, research, because there's time, so I talk a little, a little bit more. So I go and interview the 14 people and then I written up the uh, pilot study. And for the second part, I actually do tastings in both China and France to uh, then, so they have to fill in an eight page questionnaire for my research. So I will tell you more later in my methodology. So that's what I was trying to say is I collect my data through tasting. So each of the respondents, they are involved in tasting six wines, three French wines and three Chinese made wine. And they have to fill in a questionnaire of eight pages. And it is talking about half an hour to about an hour's time. And for this study, I'm going to look into the difference between the uh, how the Below average consumers, how is it different to the average and also the above average knowledge consumers? So these are the research hypotheses that I'm looking at. So how is the Chinese millennials wine consumption pattern is affected by their knowledge level? So in terms of frequency, behavior and the passion in wine. So these are, once again, we would like to look at 
and how is the willingness to pay affected by their knowledge level? And so as, how is it affected by the country of origin? So we know that a lot of the study in the past have looked into the country of origin, but this time I'm looking into domestic wine and the imported wine. So one of the very important part is, like Australia, in a way, people would just drink Australian wines. They don't import much at all. So we're looking into two countries, actually both consume a lot of the wine themselves, and they also import a lot of the wines. Right, so as I was talking about my main research, looking into 600 consumers in China and France. So in this one, I'm just talking about the 222 consumers, Chinese uh, millennials, joining the tasting experiments in groups of 10 to 25. So in three cities, Shanghai, Chengdu, and also the uh, Shanghai, uh, and the tasting of the three Chinese wine is so all these six wines were sponsored wines, so I spent three months seeking these wines. So uh, the Chinese wine included, uh, I don't know whether you have heard of, the Silver Height wineries, the Lees wineries. So these are in the categories of about 50 to 60 euro uh, locally in China. I'm sure if it's being imported in France, it will be a lot more expensive because of tax. And I sent, well, altogether, I have received 234 bottles of wine. So, so each of them is 36 bottles. So I tried to send 12 bottles to, the U, uh, uh, to France. What happened is it was sent at the wine exposed time, bad timing. So it got stuck at the custom for about a month. So that courier of 12 bottles is causing 500 euro already. And then I have to pay another 200 euro to clear the custom. <laughs> so it's telling you for the moment there are all these tax issues behind as well. And China is the same. So because I received some of the wine in Hong Kong, I received some of the wine in China, I also received some of the wine in France. So I have to do my own logistics arrangement myself. So a lot of the wine I might have to hang carry myself to the locations or else bringing it to France as well. <laughs> and um, yeah, for the, just now I mentioned about Chateau Papcamon, the wine that's provided to me, of course I hope it's the Chateau Papcamon, but it is one of the uh, very good wine, it's the uh, Chateau Le Grand Chin. It is in category, so very good you know, so it's in category of about 20, uh, uh, 20 euros. So the people that I have are working at those, and university student, and my millennial is classified between 18 to 30 years old. So the three knowledge level, as I mentioned, is BA, the below average knowledge level, and the knowledge, average knowledge level, and the above average. Okay, so I'm going to refer to BA, A, and AA later. Right, okay. So this is the demographics. You can see here, because the, it is by um, the interest and by invitation, there are a lot more female interested in joining the tasting. So it is the situation that there are more female interested in tasting or joining these events, for sure. And um, I remember two weeks ago when I was in Burgundy, so with Denton and also Steve Charter, my co-supervisor, we were sitting there at the uh, Chateau Masso. And we talk about why is women will be more interested to join tasting or making comments in tasting is because they have nothing to lose. While well, for guys, there are more issues in terms of making comments or joining tasting or saying some things about the wine. <laughs> okay, about age is roughly 50-50, but you can see in terms of BA, there are more younger people there. While well, for the above average, the, the age is already demonstrating they will be uh, older. And income level, generally in China, the uh, average is about 9k uh, euro. So obviously our, uh, our data is 
slightly below because we're talking about millennials. And it comes to the BA, we have about 32%, average we have 53%, and the above average we have 13%. Right, so this table, well, this graph is already telling a lot about what I'm going to say further. As you can refer to the blue line, which is a below average willingness to pay, the orange is the average willingness to pay, and the gray one is the above average. So it's already demonstrating the middle one, which is the average knowledge consumer. They are of high interest to pay. That means they're more willing to pay for high price for the wine. And so it's a standard deviation, you can see, which is the antenna on top. So this one, um, the sixth wine that I have is actually taste in the experiment on pairs. So two wines, French and Chinese, blind, and then two wines taste with country of origin and region of origin, and then the final two wines taste with full information. So this is because of the hedonic pricing model's development. That's why I have the three stages. But here you can see, just from the mean, we can already see the average level is slightly higher. So this information is the same as what you saw just now in the other graph. And in, when you combine everything, looking into the domestic wine and the imported wine, so it's also slightly higher for the domestic wine one. Okay, so that's Chinese wine. So because we want to make sure it is statistical significance, so we use the chi-square to look into this. And this is a simplified version. So knowledge level is related to, that means the people who are with higher knowledge level, the AA, they were able to guess correctly on the great variety more. And it's statistical significance. They were able to cor uh, correctly guess the alcohol level of the wine. They were also able to, they are also more wine educated and they are also able to drink more often. So a lot of other presentation has talked about the same thing. So that we are just confirming this before we go about. And this is with statistical significance. And coming into the part, you remember at the, as I mentioned about last year, I uh, look into wine, people drink wine. So here, have a look at the BA, there's more people who drink for the physical reason for the health if they are below average. And for those people who are above average, they will be more interested about the culture and history related to the wine. Okay? And again, with statistical significance, and why they buy, when, when we look at uh, the reason why they uh, purchase wine and what is it dependent on? So the below average knowledge consumer, they will buy because uh, dependent on the price. While the above average consumers, they will depend on the grape variety. So it's just like when we buy wine here, fingers lick, we want to look for maybe Forge, the bone dry Riesling we try at the reception, right? That's a very good one. And also, uh, these people, above average knowledge consumers, they'll be more interested to search for wines and look for other information. About wine consumption, these are also, if, we, if we're talking about below average consumer, they just enjoy the wine, they just drink, they just doesn't really have a drinking pattern. While when we talk about the above average consumer, they will go to tasting and try to enrich themselves for the knowledge. About the passion, you can see this one is a lot of the um, consumers in China, they have never been to any winery. Although we're talking about in China, the, num the growing area is actually similar, it's num one of the top areas, isn't it? So, continually into looking into the preference on domestic wine and the imported wine. The Cusco Wallace is looking into the difference between the three knowledge level. You can see one, wine one, number one, which is domestic wine, wine number five, 
And then the combined domestic wine one is showing statistical significance. When we look at the comparison between the two, just the two uh, levels, whether it's BAAA uh, or BAA or the, or the last one, you can see once again is the wine one, wine number five, or as a domestic wine having the statistical significance. So, because of this, the hypothesis one, which is looking into whether knowledge level is affecting their consumption pattern, so all of them is supported. So Chinese millennial wine consumption pattern is affected by their knowledge level. And the millennials' willingness to pay is confirmed to be uh, affected by their knowledge level. And so as the last one, domestic wine have positive influence onto their willingness to pay. So what is it telling us? Once again, so for someone who's below average, the willingness to pay is here. But if they have a little bit of knowledge about wine, their willingness to pay is actually increased quite a bit. While there's no uh, chateau or wineries much around China that people can easily access to, that, that means wine educators in China have actually become very important to drive people's willingness to pay in a way. So what I've seen in China is there's a lot of overseas wineries. So instead of just joining the wine show, they actually partner with wine educator. So it's like after one event, they were able to sell a lot of the wine through the wine educator. So this is, a, this is a new business model people are looking into currently. So joining the wine education with partnership with the wine uh, owners or wine uh, promoters overseas. So that is a good business model in China for now. Yep. So the conclusion is, so we confirm the relationship about the consumption pattern of Chinese millennial to the knowledge level. And also the domestic wine is fine to have positive influence on to the Chinese willingness to pay. So that's all for my presentation. Thank you. Thank you.